Hello and welcome to the Fix Your Fatigue podcast. Whether you can't get out of bed in the morning, your energy crashes throughout the day, or you're a biohacker looking to optimize your energy, productivity, and focus, this podcast is for you. I am Dr. Evan Hirsch, and I will be your host on your journey to resolving fatigue and optimizing your energy. And we'll be interviewing some of the top leaders in the world on fatigue resolution. Welcome. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Fix Your Fatigue podcast. I'm so glad that you're joining us here today because today I have Dr. Joan Rosenberg. So she is a best-selling author, consultant, media expert, and master clinician. Uh, and as that, as such, she's a cutting edge psychologist who is known globally as an innovative thinker, acclaimed speaker and trainer. As a two time TEDx speaker and member of the Association of Transformational Leaders, she has been recognized for her thought leadership and global influence in personal development. Along with serving as a blogger for Psychology Today, Dr. Rosenberg has been a featured expert in multiple documentaries and on TV, radio, digital and print media. A California licensed psychologist, Dr. Rosenberg speaks on how to build confidence, emotional strength, and resilience, how to achieve emotional, conversational, and relationship mastery, how to integrate neuroscience and psychotherapy, and suicide prevention. An Air Force veteran, she is a professor of graduate psychology at Pepperdine University in Los Angeles, California. Her latest book, 90 Seconds to a Life You Love, How to Master Your Difficult Feelings to Cultivate Lasting Confidence, Resilience, and Authenticity, was released February 2019. Dr. Rosenberg, thanks so much for being with me today. It's a pleasure to be with you, so look forward to our conversation. Yeah, likewise. So as we were discussing before we got on the call, a lot of people who have fatigue have mental health issues. And it sounds like you've seen a lot of this. What do you think is that relationship or what do you think has been contributing to their fatigue from a mental health standpoint from what you've seen? You know, I would, I would start with two major areas. One is how, both the combination of what and how people think. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna se separate those out a little bit. What and how people think. So that their thinking style is it's super important. And then it's the experience, whether people experience and express feelings. Mm -hmm. So it's how they experience and express feelings and then their thinking style. And both contribute significantly to the experience of either a sense of aliveness and vitality, or I believe they contribute to the opposite, the experience of fatigue and kind of feeling worn down. So what are some of those thinking styles or if there's one well, in particular? Yeah, well, think of it from the standpoint, if we just go globally, it's pessimism versus optimism. Mm. And, and I tend to, and, and what we know in general from the research is that, and there's lots of research that's out there now spanning decades, is that when somebody thinks in a negative manner, uh, whether it's pessimism or it's the actual things that people are saying to themselves, so negative self-talk or harsh self-criticism, that that compromises immune function. Mm -hmm. It actually wears the body down. So, so that kind of thinking is not going to be energizing to somebody. It's gonna, it's gonna compromise the energy source. And th th so that that's, that's one very significant way to look at it is if I'm, if I'm anticipating bad things to happen and then, and I, or I'm mean to myself, so like, I'm such an idiot, God, it's such a stupid thing for me to do. You know, I can't believe anybody likes me. What, uh, whatever the language is or the words we use, anything that starts to attack the self is gonna compromise our sense of well-being and consequently the energy that's associated with that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So where does pessimism come from? You know, I, <laughs> it's very interesting. I look at pessimism as, preemptive disappointment. So it's, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be disappointed in advance before the thing occurs. So that when the thing occurs, I've already sort of handled it because I was, I was already looking at it like it wasn't gonna work out. You're ready so for I, it. Yeah, <laughs> so, so for me, it actually has to do with poor regulation of, of unpleasant feelings. 
and so and so do you think that 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 pessimism is coming from parents or is it coming from life events or a combination what do you think it can be uh, certainly all of the above we we know that past history has a very strong influence on how we experience ourselves in the present so we we could have grown up with somebody that that says that you know no, nothing ever works out well or you know don't don't get your hopes up too high so mm -hmm. we could have all those kinds of cliche statements running in our brain from how we were taught and the so the other is that we were uh, we were harmed in some way. We experienced some measure of trauma or some measure of chaos and and negative life experiences. And 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 then we from that we then go. I, I'm never going to let myself experience that again, or I'm not going to allow myself to go there. And and now we've got the combined experience, the combined possibility of the things we were told, as well as the effect of the things we experienced. So how does somebody know if they're pessimistic? They're not looking forward to anything in life. They're mm -hmm. li literally, it's that I'm, if I'm looking at life, all, most of what I'm doing is I'm anticipating a negative event. So a, a non-preferred of life event. And I'm, I'm also anticipating a negative outcome to that event. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how we kind of look at pessimism more generally. And so there are people who say, I'm not pessimistic, I'm realistic. Mm -hmm. what is the, what's the difference? Oh, well, again, I, the real, if you're realistic, then you'll consider the option that there are po positive things that could happen too. Mm -hmm. So real, realism would be taking both into account. It would be going, and, and oftentimes what I'll, what I'll say to clients <clears throat> is that, is that because they, again, we don't know what's going to work out and what's not. So, and, and so we're gonna like, i give you an example. A client go, I have a client that's a writer going into a meeting with uh, somebody at Amazon or Netflix or something to, to pitch an idea. And, and so you know, she's, you know, this person has been met with countless disappointments across her writing career. Mm -hmm. So she's going in sort of anticipating that. Now, if she just stays stuck on the, it's not gonna work out, we have pessimism. But if I can get her to go into that meeting and say, look, um, yes, we want to acknowledge the possibility that something might not work out, except we also want to acknowledge there's a possibility that it could go in your favor, then it, let's, let's realistically acknowledge the possibility for the negative event and put our energy on anticipating the positive event. That's, to me, that's more realistic. It's both possibilities exist not just one. So how does somebody convert from being a pessimist to an optimist? But the first thing has to do with awareness. It's mm -hmm. again, it's every, everything starts with awareness and, and then followed by that awareness is an intention to change. It's in fact, I was just talking about that this morning <clears throat> with somebody. And, and the, and the first thing that I, we, I talked about is like, he's now, he wasn't curious about his mind before. He wasn't curious about, he, he was in a bit like one, one bad event in the morning meant that the whole day was ruined, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of people have that kind of a point of view, but right. that's actually faulty thinking. And it's, there's a pessimistic nature to it. Nothing's gonna ever work out for me. And, and so the first thing is to say, I don't wanna think this way anymore. And, and as I said, for me, it's also a reflection of not dealing with unpleasant feelings very well. So the so it means a combined effort. It's the awareness, but not only what I'm thinking, it's also an awareness of thinking patterns I get into. Plus, it's dealing with the unpleasant feelings underneath that, that I see myself as more capable in general of being able to handle unpleasant feelings. So how do you how do you do that reprogramming? It seems like I know that from my own work that I've done for mindset and whatnot, it's hard. What sort of things do you recommend? Uh, well, the again, first thing is in intentionality. I, I'm, I, I'm aware I want to change. I'm going to spend what I'm going to do my best on a daily basis to be aware of how I'm what I'm saying and how I'm saying it. Um, and in fact, one of the things I, I told, and it's going to be repeated practice. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So there, I make no, uh, there's no way for me to diminish or, or downplay the importance of repeated practice and catching ourselves because it's repetition as, as you very well know, that makes the change in the neural pathways in the brain. So we have to do something repeated. And so the, the, what I told the, the person I was working with this morning was that his, I wanted him to work on being aware of when he caught himself saying something that was pessimistic. So, it, and, and you know, he's, he's starting to do that. He's, he's more curious about how he's thinking now. And I asked him to actually to print out a list of what are called in, uh, in cognitive behavioral therapy are called cognitive distortions or to say it more, more simply, faulty thinking patterns. Mm -hmm. Because I want him to start to notice when he engages in a faulty thinking pattern as well, because that creates an experience of constriction. It creates an experience of feeling trapped. And again, it's an energy drain. It creates mm -hmm. more of a depressed thinking style that comes out of that. So an example, and sort of the example I gave earlier about um, anticipating, or one, uh, one, this bad incident and during the day means my whole day is ruined. There's a, there's a cognitive distortion. There's a faulty thinking pattern attached to that. Mm -hmm. And it's that one thing equals all things, right? So it's, no, it's one thing equals one thing, mm -hmm. right? This difficult incident just means it's a difficult incident. That's it. So, so it's helping him start to be aware of the patterns of thinking. And then the next thing um, we'll be working with him on is helping him be able to experience and move through those unpleasant feelings more effectively and following that to then be able to express them more. Mm -hmm. And it seems like what you mentioned previously around being ready for disappointment, that's a, that's a safety strategy, right? And absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to cushion myself. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's a defense, it's a defensive emotional maneuver. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nope. I'm keeping myself safe over here. I'm yep, mm -hmm. not going to get hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then how fast have you seen um, these strategies work? You know, is it the kind of thing where if somebody really applies themselves and they're paying attention and they're recognizing these, these negative thought patterns that they can really shift things in a week or does it take a couple months? What do you think? You know, yes. well, I think that actually if the research seems to suggest that new neural growth in the brain shows up after about three months. So <clears throat> I would, can will someone notice changes faster than that? Yes, they will. Uh, but the, in terms of it then being a, a shift over from uh, my first default is to think pessimistically to a default to I'm going to be more optimistic or something like that, that there's going to be, it's going to be, we need a little bit of lag time. Um, but, you know, the other thing is we can have awarenesses and insights that in a flash change our life, right? And, and mm -hmm. so the, um, and I have an example in, in my mind about it, the, uh, but the, what do I wanna say? The idea here is that, and my thinking on this is how fast does it take someone to think a thought, mm -hmm. right? And, and at times that's how quickly change can occur. Excellent. And, you know, some people might be listening to this and thinking, gosh, three months in order to get that change. But that's pessimistic thinking, right? That's I mean, right. Right. I mean, if you've been alive for 40, 50, 60 years, three months is nothing. Right, right. right? Exactly. I thought that three years of residency was a lot. But, you know, then you get to practice medicine for the next 50 years. Right, right. right. So yeah. it's, it's all relative. So it's important for people to remember that, right? Well, let me put it, let me put it in a slightly different uh, angle in addition to what you said. <clears throat> uh, generally speaking, I'll work with somebody approximately once a week. And, and there's somebody that I started to see the probably September of this year, August, September of this year, but very difficult trauma history and um, unbelievably harsh uh, and, and mean, harsh self-criticism, self-hatred. And if I listen to the kinds of things that I've talked with her about over these intervening weeks now, and we're doing this in February, 
Um, we haven't even spent a day's worth of time together, hmm. right? So we're maybe at 15 hours, 16 hours. But the, that 16 hours of time is light, it's taken her light years from where she was when we started in August, September. So, mm -hmm. so it's also developing that kind of perspective because we're not really talking about three months, probably. Right. We're actually talking about a much shorter amount of time uh, for people, but it just, it, it takes the repetition for the, for the new way of thinking to be your default way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So why would people, I mean, people are obviously not successful when they there are some people who are not successful when they try to pay attention and they try to change these negative thoughts into positive thoughts and opportunities and whatnot why do you think people aren't successful at doing that what is kind of what are the what's the thinking that jumps in is it just pessimistic thinking where it's like oh this is too much work or oh i'm never going to get there or something or is there anything else well no i there's a, probably a couple things that it doesn't it, you know it doesn't meet with immediate gratification it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. meet with Oh, now I feel so much better. It's it, it, the the changes sometimes are subtle and incremental. I, I would say that that's one reason. Um, I think that so we want we want the immediate gratification of feeling better right away. And the another one is that that when we start to change, change because it's activating new neural pathways. Change has different bodily sensations to it. This new way of being in the world is going to bring up other experiences and other ways of feeling. And when we're doing that for the first time, that new set of sensations is unfamiliar. And because it's unfamiliar, it feels uncomfortable. So because of the unfamiliarity and the discomfort, I'll just back away and not do it again because of what it feels like. And again, I'll give you another example here. There's a woman, woman that I've been working with who for actually for a long stretch of time, ended up getting a divorce, has been single for four years and is now starting to date. But she wasn't a big dater before she got married. Mm -hmm. And she's describing, she's, she's in her forties, but is describing feeling like she's 17. It's like, what is this dating experience? And how raw and how uncomfortable it feels. The parts of it feel exciting and parts of it feel like, oh my God, what is this? Because all of the sensations, because she knew the person that she married for a very, very long time. So there was familiarity. There's a known quantity. And, and this time it's not. And, and so there's all this unfamiliarity and it's like, I don't wanna go there, right? <laughs> So, but, but that's because so much is being elicited and evoked that she's not ever dealt with before. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So people will back off because of that. Right. So let's talk about that discomfort in the body. So emotions will, well, can you kind of take me through, like, I guess why that happens? And then we can talk about how to transform it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I actually talk about this in, in my book, 90 Seconds to a Life You Love. I spent a long time trying to understand what made it so difficult for people to deal with unpleasant feelings, because as, as messy and as damaging as our thinking can be, what I found is that people experienced even more problems when they were having a hard time experiencing and expressing unpleasant feeling. So that, that, so as I started to go through the research and, and really most of this started to come out more significantly in the late 1990s and into the early 2000s. And, and what the neuroscientists started to talk about there is that the, um, that a couple, I would say kind of think about it in kind of three or four steps. The first thing is that we're one interconnected whole. We're not, a, we're not a brain and mind and then a body and that they're separate and distinct and they don't really relate to each other. Mm -hmm. We're one interconnected whole. The second part of that is to understand that, that what the research started to talk about is that the most, most of us tend to come to know what we feel emotionally 
through bodily sensation. And the, so it's like, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, that means like if I get embarrassed and you see the redness in my face, you know, my neck and face, I might be experiencing um, the heat that comes with that, that redness. You'd see the redness, I feel the heat. The heat is my bodily sensation signal that I'm embarrassed. So, and we can, we can talk about through that, we can talk about that through a variety of feelings. And, and, but most of us come to know what we feel emotionally through those bodily sensations. And, and what dawned on me in that is that it's not that we don't wanna feel the whole range of what we feel, it's that we don't want to feel the bodily sensation that helps us know the emotion. That's the thing we wanna get away. So if we get into this discomfort of what disappointment feels like because of the heaviness in the chest or anger feels like it's coursing through my body, I'm not sure if you can hear the sound outside. Uh, You're good. Okay, good. All right. Uh, so the the uh, the the week or the anger coursing through my body because it feels so intolerable. Then I then I say to myself, uh, I'm not going to let myself go there again. The unfamiliar the dis unfamiliarity and the discomfort of those sensations. So my my thinking has been if I can help somebody understand one that the hard the hard part about experiencing feelings has to do with bodily sensations and then help them understand it's short lived bodily sensations, hmm. then people will be more likely to lean into them and then get the benefit of having experienced them. And same thing to kind of, if you will, the, the, the fatigue part, when we shut down on feelings, just like when we use negative thinking, it totally depletes ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the approach that I've taken is, and that's the, the title tied to the title of the book, is to understand that when a feeling gets triggered in, in the body, then it's, uh, there's a rush of biochemicals that create those bodily sensations, and then they that rush into the bloodstream and then flush out of the bloodstream in roughly 90 seconds. So that it's one's ability to lean in and to tolerate those short-lived bodily sensations that help people then lean into the unpleasant feelings. So you just got to hang on for 90 seconds. Yeah, well, I, I talk about it. Actually, yes, absolutely. I kind of liken it to, uh, to surfing waves, like mm -hmm. ocean waves. And the key is just think, of, just think of riding the waves. So you can boogie board it. You can body surf <laughs> it. You can be in a canoe, a kayak. I don't care how you do it. Just ride the bodily sensation waves. And it'll make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. That's great. And so... Well, I guess I know my answer to my next question. I was going to say, well, how do we convert these uncomfortable emotions? But actually, that's not the goal. No, I don't want. I don't want them converted. But okay. I'm not going. I'm not asking somebody to languish in them either. Mm -hmm. It's to simply acknowledge, accept, and trust whatever it is that one's experiencing in the moment. They're spontaneous reactions to life, right? So it's not that we cut. We want to. Sometimes we want to cut those out and go not and not have it, but we can't. And, and so when we shut down on feelings, we shut down on aliveness. And, mm -hmm. and so and whether, and again, most people do pleasant feelings well, but when you're shutting down on unpleasant feelings, you're literally, uh, you're taking yourself, you're taking yourself down and you're, you're comp compromising your energy, depleted, depleted self, less mm -hmm. vitality. Yeah, that makes sense. And so is it 90 seconds regardless of the emotion? No, I mean, there, I would say that there's nuances. When there's mm -hmm. trauma, trauma encodes in the body differently, right? So it's, so it's not, it's not going to be the same thing as a, as a common everyday reaction to something. So, the, so it, some stuff might feel like it lasts longer because it's tied into an adrenaline response. And <clears throat> or like panic is, more, is tied into adrenaline, right? So, so that there's going, to be, there's going to be a long, what feels like a longer lasting experience of something. So trauma or panic where we have a, adrenaline or cortisol kind of kicking in, uh, then, then stuff is going to feel like it lasts longer. The other situation where it seems to last longer is when it, people get into certain ways of, again, thinking that then keep it running. 
So instead of it feeling like the feeling is short lived, it's like, because many times people look at me and go, what are you talking about 90 seconds? Like that's, that's like baloney, right? It's, it's not 90 seconds. I've been dealing with this for months, <laughs> right? Or, or perhaps even years. But, so, but it feels like feelings linger because either we're trying not to think of what we're thinking of, mm -hmm. right? Or, or we're recycling over the same thought and the same memory. And, and as a result, every time we think about that same thought and same memory, it activates everything that was tied to that thought or memory. So all the feelings that keep on, they keep on coming back. So it feels like they never get resolved. And then the last thing that I think happens uh, is that harsh self-criticism also keeps it feeling like unpleasant feelings just continue, that they just linger. So those, those are kind of three main reasons that I think that it, we, we live with the experience of that something's, something's not short-lived, it's long-lived. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. And so if you have to hold on for 90 seconds and you're having a hard time holding on, I feel like there's a mantra. I mean, I don't, I don't do this very well. I haven't, uh, you know, the last couple of years I've gotten better at having some insight into my emotions and when I feel that discomfort being able to stop, but it's taken me a lot of years and a lot of work. And I feel like if there was a particular mantra, when that starts happening, you can just be like, all right, just hold on for 90 seconds. Have you found anything that's particularly helpful? I, you know what? I have some people that'll tell me that they just keep, it's 90 seconds, 90 seconds, uh, right. 90 seconds. <laughs> right? and, and it typically doesn't even last that long, um, frankly. But, but other, the, my main suggestion for people is take deep, slow breaths. Mm -hmm. Just breathe, breathe into the experience. Let it hit its intensity and subside. And, and I guess the other point that I would make here is that it's not necessarily one wave of sensations, one bodily wave. It's one or more short-lived bodily waves. But if you breathe into it and stay present to it by breathing slowly, you'll move through it fairly mm -hmm. quickly. And people are really surprised about it. They, they, I mean, I get, I get emails that say, I didn't believe you and I tested it out. And, and it's like, they found that they actually moved through something far more easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see myself being like, whoa, check out that wave. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's excellent. And I know that, you know, a lot of our listeners are professionals and entrepreneurs and, you know, people who are just trying to do their best in life. And I have learned that the more comfortable you are with discomfort, um, the more successful you are. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Why do you I've think, got... why do you no, think that is? Well, uh, for me, it's entirely tied to uh, because I'm. Uh, it's entirely tied to risk taking, mm -hmm. uh, perseverance, and resilience. So it's like if I'm, I what I what I often like to say is that it's not the risk that someone is afraid of. So if we think of somebody who's a high performer or an entrepreneur, it's not the risk people are afraid of. It's the emotional outcome that they anticipate from the risk that they want to back off from. So if I'm going to go into this, so if I, let's say I'm going to go do public speaking, right? Mm -hmm. It's a different crowd or it's a, it's a, I'm placing more value and more importance on this particular group of people to speak in front of, then I'm going to feel more vulnerable. And, and if it doesn't turn out the way I want, I'm likely to feel more disappointed and more embarrassed or something like that, that it, that whatever occurred, occurred. Again, that's just focusing on the negative outcome, right? But if I, so if I'm landing there for now and I'm focused in that way, it's not what I'm actually doing in front of the group in terms of the speaking that I'm concerned about. The thing I'm really concerned about is the emotional outcome, the embarrassment and the disappointment. So the, those who are willing to live with that discomfort and keep going no matter what, that makes the difference. So that's why to me, being able to experience and move through unpleasant feelings is crucial to success and resilience and emotional strength mm -hmm. and confidence. That reminds me of a, 
I can't remember. I kind of want to say it was on the Brady Bunch or something when I was growing up where somebody had to give a speech and somebody coached them, you know, just pretend that everybody's wearing underwear in the audience. Right. Like if you're feeling vulnerable and you're feeling intimidated, just put them all on uh, the same plane or, you know, they're all humans or right. they're all, you know, um, they're all vulnerable as well. Right. Right. You ever use any mind tricks like that? No. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't, I don't. I don't know if no, they work. Or I, no. Well, people people do use that. So I mean, I, and I've heard that sort of thing as well. But for me, it's if I can acknowledge the vulnerability, which is really mm -hmm. what we're talking about. It's not. It's not anxiety. It's vulnerability. It's a sense I could get hurt. What's the hurt? The embarrassment and the disappointment. Right. So, but if I can go into a situation going, look, if 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 embarrassment and disappointment are the worst outcomes. I think I can, I know I can handle that. I'm going to go take the risk. I'll let myself be vulnerable, but mm -hmm. then vulnerability becomes a strength. So I'm more inclined to use that kind of thinking than to see people in their underwear. I'd get too distracted. If I... <laughs> it's like, wait a second. Why are they wearing pink underwear? Exactly. <laughs> Elephants on your under, come on. <laughs> That's great. Well, and that yeah. makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So let's pivot to anxiety. How okay. does anxiety play into all this? What are um, what are some of the? I guess what's let's start with the what's the cause of anxiety? Well, again, if we look at the way psychology defines anxiety, anxiety is this diffuse apprehension or this broad-based concern that something bad is going to happen in the future. And I mean, does the word fit with life circumstances? Absolutely it fits. Mm -hmm. Except if I were to chat with 10 people, then invariably what I would get is almost 10 different answers for what anxiety meant to them. Mm -hmm. Someone would say frustration, somebody else would say anger, somebody, it, I would just get almost 10 different answers. So there's no consistency. And as a result, that word has no value to me other than to point to something happening underneath that. And the thing it points to for me is that someone has a hard time potentially both experiencing and expressing unpleasant feelings. Mm. And, and my work, uh, the, the body of work that's, that's in the 90 Seconds to a Life You Love book is all centered on one's capacity to experience and move through and express eight unpleasant feelings. And that, and that when you can do that, it, it's a life changer. And, and, that, and so for me, what's underneath the anxiety first tends to be an experience of vulnerability. The vulnerability for me is one of the eight that I talk about. And, and so is someone feeling, having that sense that they could get hurt. So if we look at the whole COVID-19 experience, for example, or everything else that was that has been from a, all the different other confluences of things happening during this period, then it's really been a heightened, it's heightened people's sense of vulnerability. People have talked about an anxiety pandemic. That's no, really a vulner vulnerability pandemic. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, people are way more aware of their own vulnerability. So, so for me, the first thing to do with anxiety is to go, all right, um, if I take the word anxiety away, so I stop people from using the word anxiety, uh, and or anything like it, apprehension, words like that, gone. What's underneath that? Okay, vulnerability. So are you feeling vulnerable? Are you having the sense you could get hurt? Uh, in many cases, that's enough. That, and the change in words, interestingly, for me, tends to calm people down. Mm. It's like, and, and so if you notice, even you're, mentally, if you notice um, what it feels like internally, to think I'm anxious or I feel anxiety or I have anxiety as opposed to, oh, I'm feeling vulnerable. There's a shift mm -hmm. and it's more calming. Mm -hmm. the, the, and if it's not vulnerability, then it's one or more of the other seven feelings. So, it's, uh, if, if, so we have vulnerability or we have sadness or shame or helplessness or anger or embarrassment, disappointment and frustration. So if, if it's not vulnerability, then it's one or more of the other seven. And when, again, when you name things accurately, it brings a sense of calm. It doesn't keep that anxious state going. 
Why do you think that is? There's something, well, it, it, I think it, there's, uh, when we name things, we're, we're sort of taking language to interact with our experience. So I think of kind of a hemis from a hemispheric standpoint in the brain, mm -hmm. that, that we have a right left crossover in the brain. And when we, when we can organize an experience, I think that we feel better about it. So instead of being this global, vague, indiscernible cloud of anxiety, I go, oh, I'm actually disappointed. Then it feels way more manageable. I've, org I've organized the experience within me and now, now it feels way more manageable to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it seems like there's a congruence between what you're feeling and those words. It's just more accurate so that you can better pay attention. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah. Very interesting. So let's talk about confidence. So okay. Where does where does lack of confidence come from? Uh, well, at lack of confidence, um, lack of confidence for me comes with comes from not being able to experience and move through those eight unpleasant feelings. Mm. So my my definition of confidence is that it's the deep sense that you can handle the emotional outcome of whatever you face or whatever you pursue. Mm. So what does that mean? It's handling the eight unpleasant feelings. And my experience has been when somebody doesn't handle those feelings well, they don't feel like they're very capable in handling life. When they see themselves as, I got this, this is the worst emotional outcome that's gonna happen. One or more of those eight. I mean, think, think about everyday experiences and what we go through. Mm -hmm. There's not much more than those eight really. Uh, and, and so when they feel like they can handle it, then they, it's like, I got life, I can go do life. So, and, and what's interesting to me about this is that um, we have the idea that we're confident, and then we go do something. So like take an action, like, I, let's say I want to go learn how to play tennis. Mm -hmm. But I'm but I'm not, I don't even know how to hold a racket, right? Or my backhand is really sloppy, what, whatever it is then I might, um, I might see myself as, well, I should be more confident and then I'll go out and I'll play. But that's not the way it works. It's you take the action and then you gain the confidence. And what's similar to this is speaking. We have this idea that I, when I'm confident, then I'll speak up in public. I'll speak up at the meeting. Hmm. It's not the way it works. It's as you speak and through speaking, you gain the confidence. And, and for me, the, the two, probably the two most important things for people to do is to be able to see themselves or make it so that they're, they have the capacity to experience the eight unpleasant feelings and that they are willing to express themselves. And that, that speaking up singular is one of the, it's those two things are, are crucial to somebody developing confidence. Interesting. And that makes a lot of sense. So I could see, you know, maybe, I, you know, I do some incantations in the morning and some positive affirmations and I could see adding in, you know, no matter what emotion I experience today, I got it. No matter what I feel in my body today, I got it and I'm going to be fine. Yeah. How would they, how would that change things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you're going to you're willing to go take risks you wouldn't be willing to take otherwise. Mm -hmm. And and I really believe that I, and I, I'm sure there's ways to prove it, but I think speaking up changes our molecules. Mm -hmm. I really do. So that there's there's something that happens internally, that that when you start to speak up, you go from a person who hasn't spoken up to now being a person who speaks up in a wide variety of situations and feels like you can do that whenever you need to. Again, caveat, positive, kind, well-intended, not malicious. So, but when you, when you feel like you can approach life in that way, game changer. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about some of your programs. So I know you've got emotional mastery. I'm curious what that is. 
Well, it's, you know, the, it's, it's uh, coming under the rubric of my confidence course. So it's the, again, the emotional mastery is helping people really be able to, to do what we've been talking about. It's being able to handle the way they think about things. So again, not just what they're thinking, but how they're thinking it. And it's also helping them be able to experience and express feeling, thoughts and feelings ultimately, but feeling is a super important part of it. And it's also helping them be able to make sense of and move their way through difficult life experiences in the past. Mm -hmm. So it, it really combines kind of those five or six different elements. And is that the confidence course that's coming that up? The, yeah, that, that is the confidence course that's coming up. So I, I just, uh, I, the, the branding part of this, the naming part of this has never been easy for me. So they, uh, I, I mean, what was I doing? I was helping people develop some mastery emotionally, but, uh, but for, for the time being, it's being called the confidence course. Nice. I actually really like it. I saw it on your website and then I saw it um, something for the trainers or train the trainer or something right. like that. Right. Right. I thought that that was a great way of saying, you know, that you have a practitioner program as well. But Yes, I, that, that'll be coming up. And again, there are many clinicians who find the practicality and the utility of this approach is super effective. I mean, it's I frankly, I've been working on it for 25 or more years. Um, it just didn't, it didn't make it into the public space. I was using it, teaching uh, graduate students and working with my clients, but it, it just hadn't made it to the public, but um, I felt like I was sitting on a gold mine for, and, and the, but the approach is really effective and makes a big difference in people's lives. So whether you, whether one does it alone or they, they do the, if you will, the consumer facing program, or they do the practitioner program that will follow. Nice. And what's the setup of that program, the consumer program? How much time do they get with you? Is it like, what are the, the different features? Is that all laid out yet? Yeah, no, it is. It's five, five basic modules. Uh, and so again, the first being helping people understand what emotional strength is and outlining everything around those eight feelings. Uh, I'll end up talking about, again, resolving this faulty thinking. It's drawn, it's drawn, the content is drawn largely from the book, but I'm doing a deep dive. There's a difference between reading something and hearing something. And, and the explanation makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll then and I'll also help people understand the importance of things like uh, really ending harsh self-criticism because of what it does to us. Uh, and it's, uh, I think it's the single most damaging thing we can do to ourselves. Uh, is, is engage in hard self-criticism. So I'll talk extensively about that. I'll talk extensively about the importance of taking in compliments. Uh, and I will also uh, then talk about the importance of speaking up uh, and, and a little bit on, the, on, the, on what I call disguised grief as well. It's, it's think leftover resentments and grudges, this leftover mm -hmm. grief. And so that'll all be part of it. Uh, the first hour, uh, it's eight weeks. The first hour of every week is me teaching and, and approaching these concepts. And then uh, I'll put a hard stop to that and then engage in Q&A and laser coaching. So it's actually 16 hours with me um, over an eight week period. Sounds excellent. Yeah. Good. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So we'll put that link below. And then you also have a, a free gift for our audience. Looks like it's going to be at drjoanrosenberg.com slash gift. And we'll put that link below as well. Right. And what is included? What is that again? Yeah, you, I'm, I'm going to be embarrassed to say that I have not gone on and recalled what that is. <laughs> it's so, okay. I'll, so I'll, just deal, I'll, I'll deal with I'll my embarrassment and say, I believe it's um, the part of uh, chapter one of my book. It's also an outline of the eight unpleasant feelings. And then there's, I believe there's a third element, a third piece there. So. Yes. Yeah, so the printable PDF guide of the 90 second reset uh, with the eight feelings and then confrontation prep checklist. Oh, okay. That was the third. Okay. And then audio excerpt from the 90 seconds to a life you love. That's pretty close. <laughs> yeah, you, you did great. I'm, I'm the same way. It's like, uh, which one was that? <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. Yeah. There's, Excellent. A, there's, a few, there's a few that are up there. So. Yeah. So for anybody, if you want to find more information about Dr. Joan, we'll put all those links below. Dr. Joan, thanks so much for joining me today. Pleasure. It was wonderful having you on. Uh, thank you so much. 
I hope you learned something on today's podcast. If you did, please share it with your friends and family and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It's really helpful for getting this information out to more fatigued people who desperately need it. Sharing all the experts I know and love and the powerful tips I have on fatigue is one of my absolute favorite things to do. If you'd like more information, please sign up for my newsletter where I share all important facts and information about fatigue, from the foods and supplements to the programs and products that I use personally and recommend to others so that they can live their best lives. Just go to fixyourfatigue.com forward slash newsletter to sign up and I will send you this great information. Thanks for being part of my community. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. It is provided with the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you're looking for help with your fatigue, you can visit my website and work with us at fixyourfatigue.com. And remember, it's important that you have someone in your corner who is a credentialed healthcare professional to help you make changes. This is very important, especially when it comes to your health. Thanks for listening, and have an amazing day.